This is Coda Radio, episode 283 for November 16th, 2017. everyone, and welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and its related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Why me? Well, my name's Chris, but that doesn't matter. It's our host. That's who you want to know about. Why, yes, it's Mike. Hello! Hello, Mr. Fisher. Hello, hello, sir. We're on a special Thursday revival episode because we thought, you know what we ought to do is let's tell everybody we're switching to Mondays, tell everybody to come live, and then switch to a Thursday for one random week because we like to keep everybody on their toes. We, that's what we do here at the Coda Radio program. We're trolls. <laughs> it's our primary objective, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's also the downloads thing, but that's, that's secondary to the mission. Well, uh, how are you doing today? Has it been a busy day for you, Mr. Dominic? It has been a busy week. It's yeah. going to be a busy month. And yeah. traditionally, sleepy old December is going to be busy as hell, too. Well, you really, then you really just sort of went all in when you made your recent uh, kind of announcement. I mean, how many, was this like two shots of whiskey in? I mean, I couldn't believe this when I saw this. Uh, Mike gets the community bug, and it's a feature. So uh, I guess you got, you, you got out, went out, did some community stuff, came back and said, you know what, self? I need to punish myself and go to an event every single month for at least the rest of the year, if not into next year. So uh, apparently that's right. crazy. It, so I was at Death Fest, Florida, which we'll talk about a bit in the show. And for December, I'm flying up to New York and going to Death Fest, New York. Uh, both of these are Google developer sponsored events. And it's not really a punishment for me, more my immune system. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, oh, the conference flu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are so going to get sick. <laughs> I mean, not to laugh, but that, I just love that you know going into it that's going to be a problem. <laughs> well, especially going from Florida to, you know, holy crap, winter. Yeah, yeah. But why? I mean, so I I always come on here and be like, oh, boy, it's really something when you meet people and you get to talk to people and uh, so many crazy things happen and you really see how great everybody is. But I, these are all my highfalutin reasons. Why are you doing this? Why? Because I had a ball at Death Fest, Florida. Excuse me as I pour a drink. Um, I had a great time. Seriously, I met some great people. I got some schwag. <laughs> I had wonderful conversations with Googlers. Really? Wait, oh, wait a minute. You're not going Googlesoft on me, are you? You are, aren't you? You're going Googlesoft. What, is, what, what does that mean? Uh-huh. Google? Uh-huh. I would say that I'm hard for Google. So what is Google Soft? I don't know. I just kind of feel like, uh, yeah, exactly. You got a little Google hard is what it is. So why is Google doing you know, this? Like, they're putting on some sort I mean, of big event. I mean, this is like a big cost to them. Well, they put it on a partnership with like Google developer groups, right? Okay. Oh, okay. And yeah. I'm not an expert in like non-for-profit financing, or even if this is non-for-profit. Well, I, I look forward to hearing your report when we get there in the show, because I, I don't know. I think that's going to be I think it's going to be pretty interesting if it, if it really got you that excited to keep going. Uh, so I guess the sort of the calls out there, if you're looking for Coda Radio listeners to meet up or guide you where to go, what would be a good way for them to sort of reach out? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Dumanuko, and if you're at the conference, find the nearest bar. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There I will. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Chris. That was nice. That was great. <laughs> little true, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. All kidding aside, though, it's nice to be at an event where you talk to someone about like, AI and bots. And they don't think you just got loaded watching, you know, Pal Nelson right or Tron, mm. and that you're completely insane right now. <laughs> Speaking of uh, completely insane, uh, this is really insane. Uh, Ranger Rube has made a JSON API for Jupiter Broadcasting shows and has shared it in our Coder Radio subreddit. He's got a link to his GitHub page. I just think this is super nice. He says it's a simple project. But he thinks it might be ready for some users, and it's it's brilliant uh, because we actually have a we have an issue right now with a lot of our Jupiter Broadcasting apps that get created by community members. Is they're good for like a year or so, 
And then they can kind of get neglected. Like we have uh, a lot of people emailing us right now about our Roku app, which we love. We got this. We had this great app on Roku, but the problem is it's it hasn't been updated in a while, and so some shows are missing, some things don't work quite right, and we get a fair amount of email about it. And I feel like we have we have limited um, options. Whereas if we had kind of like a standardized way for developers to have built these applications, this might not be a problem right now. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. A centralized open API that can just be, you know, used at will, right? I think that's amazing. Yeah, so it's pretty nice. And uh, thank you, Ranger Rube, for, uh, or Ranger Ob, or whatever you want to go by. Thank you very much for doing that. And uh, if you get any further, make sure you reach out to Angela at jupiterbroadcasting.com and uh, keep her updated on what you're doing. And also, if you haven't already, check out our Jupiter Dev Discord channel, discord.me. Mm-hmm slash discord.me slash Jupiter Colony. And then once you get in there, you'll see the Jupiter Dev channel, which is right next to the Coda Radio channel. Uh, so you can hang out and do all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool. Pretty nice. Can I throw you off course? Yeah, man. Speaking of JB listeners, I just hired a JB listener. Really? Tell me about it. He, his name is Bobby, and he is a Linux hippie. But <laughs> we'll forgive him that. Love it. What kind of Linux hippie? What breed? Do you know? Is like, I have no idea. Okay. He started talking, and I, I kind of fell asleep. Um, Probably Arch. But, you know, we talk a lot about interview process, and I have found the way you interview dev candidates. Oh. You make them write you a JS Taylor Swift app. Oh, man. Oh, yes. Now, why is it a Taylor Swift app specifically? Like, what's the uh, twist well, of the I already had a Katy, I already had an Angular one for Katy Perry from previous challenges. Sure, so, so naturally. So naturally, it has yeah. to be. Yeah. Next up, Ever Levine. Why not, like... Um, Brent Spiner, or... Uh, I don't know who that is. Okay, all right, Data from the next generation. Why not like uh, like an ironic computer character? Like, why is it... No, t- no, oh, no, no, okay. don't you no. notice the theme? I only like singers who I, are pretty girls. I, I did notice this theme, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm very specific. But it I wasn't is, sure if oh, so much, is it that, or is it like this is a twisted way to make these guys work on something that's ridiculous, which I think it really is, and you just won't admit it, is you're, you're, being, you're being twisted. I, you know what I'm going to do at 2 a.m. tonight on Twitter? I'm going to publish my Google Play playlist for you. Oh, well, no, I believe you. I, I, I be- yeah. I'm not saying it's not inspired. Um, well, yeah. good. I'm glad that – so that worked out. Is he in your area or is it a remote thing? He's in the great look of Texas. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And actually, he's right in the Discord, so he's running Ubuntu GNOME 1604. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Hello, Bobby. Hello, Bobby. I was running Pop! OS, but, you know, so not a commercial for System76 audio issues. Hmm. Mm, yeah, that, we did just have to switch off that before the show started. But it's, it sounded like that might have been a CPU load issue. There might have been something that was going cray-cray on the CPU. Nothing was wrong. Hmm. So did you see anyway. the? Oh, did you see the big? Let's. We want to slip into some hoopla. I really, I really only have one item. Uh, technically hoopla. That's that's like current news hoopla, and Are that's hurt me? that's the big Kotlin update. Uh, Released with objective native, so it's Kotlin slash native zero uh, Objective C interop WebAssembly and more all coming in. We're getting. You're, I'm talking Objective C APIs and iOS and macOS WebAssembly as a target platform. Uh, it seems like this is kind of a big release, but I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a uh, JetBrains guy like you are. So, but I'm the I one actually have, in here. Haven't been using JetBrains. I've been using VS Code. Um, what happened to the new I'm JetBrains just... religion? I thought we were getting all on board with that. Well, you know, they decided to attack my Objective-C, and we just don't do that. Well, now they've given you – what do you mean? This is so – they're giving support for the Objective-C APIs. Is this – you're saying no, this is an no, attack no. because – you want to write code, you should write it in Objective-C. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't understand. I just want to like – okay. So now I think Colin's a great language. I think all languages other than Swift are great. And maybe real basic, but why do you need Kotlin to be able to do Cocoa APIs? Right? So when they say Objective C interop, yes, it can enter interop with Objective C now. And that's actually a side effect of it being able to interop with C, because Objective C, part of the glory and perfection that is Objective C, is a super stiff C. Stop me if I ever go too crazy on Objective C here. Why is it necessary? to put salt on the swift root wound by now saying that Kotlin can interrupt Objective-C. Well, that's the new competitive benchmark, obviously. Bring your mic. 
I mean, uh, Objective C. Well, uh, doing what Swift can do. You know, I still don't think Swift is that Anything good. Anything Swift can do, I can do better. Yeah, but the, the I is Objective C in that statement. Ooh. Well, I'm pretty excited about the WebAssembly stuff. It's, no, it's experimental. Not it's ex- really? You're not going to like that. Why? So WebAssembly is a dream. So for really those who think, don't know, I mean, WebAssembly... It's, it's landed in all the major browsers now. It's officially, like, totally deployed. It is going to take an extremely or a relatively long time mm. for that to be something seriously used. Um, for those who don't know, the idea of WebAssembly is that there's, like, a literal WebAssembly, right? So where, you know, you're, you whatever programming language would compile into assembly or to something like that, like native code, now JavaScript or, you know, the idea is not to use your script so like Kotlin could. Um, I think Dart can do this too, right, in a few other languages. I, I know TypeScript can. Why I like this idea, but it's one of those things where there's so much baggage in the web space that I'm curious as to how it's going to work. Mm. And I am pretty skeptical, I, to be honest. I mean, another good idea was Silverlight that abysmally failed because baggage in the web, web space and having to use legacy browsers. Yeah, yeah, fair yeah, enough. That is, back. that is, I guess, yeah. But see, WebAssembly, I guess, I'm a little more excited about just because it's got it's got wider and wider adoption, and I, it feels like there's more and more push to to make yeah, these applications you, in the browser more and more feature rich, more performant, and that's not really Silverlight wasn't necessarily trying to address that. Sure, that's probably a weak example. Um, but let me let me make a what I think is a more salient point. In the last 10 years, you had, or really, yeah, in, ten, in the last 10 to 15 years, don't bet against JavaScript. You would have right. every single time. Right, right. Like JavaScript may have lagged behind, and people could show off, oh, look how nice my native thing is, or look how crappy the syntax is. But JavaScript is like getting better and better every day. Um, if you're in a modern browser environment, modern JavaScript, whatever it is, is amazing. Like, really, there is no, like, all of Alice is being written in JavaScript, right? There, the JavaScript is not just some browser language to animate your GIFs or do whatever dumb marketing thing the marketing department wants you to do on the web page. <laughs> it's really, not, I mean, I'm not being a jerk, but it's really a full-fledged prototypical inheritance programming language. And historically, since long before we've been doing the show, but let's just take it since we've been doing the show, Everybody who's bet against JavaScript has lost mm. in some way, right? Mm-hmm. So, or they've become marginalized into like neat boutique areas. Of like, Ooh, we're native, you know, whatever. Or we're, remember CoffeeScript? I know it's the default in Rails, but how much CoffeeScript do you actually see like people enthusiastically promoting mm. using in production? <laughs> and, or Dart. Sorry, Google, but yeah. I mean, TypeScript is kind of doing it, but TypeScript's main feature is that it's just, hmm, wait a minute, 2% of JavaScript. Do you know what other language had a similar strategy? Come on, Chris. Don't let me hang in. Don't say PHP. I'm, I don't know that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay. I thought maybe you were going for the All dig. Right. No, no, no. I, I am not attacking PHP today. Okay. Well, uh, hey, look at that. Ranger Root is in the uh, is in the Discord room today. The uh, guy that made our uh, JSON API. That's pretty cool. Good work, Ranger. Well, so there you go. That's the hoopla. The new, like the newsworthy, happened today hoopla. But that's fine. Don't be excited. I tried. I was really trying to surprise you. No, I am. Story. So, so, so the whole web. You, you kind of got me off on a web. I did right? because I've been meaning to piss on that sure. for a while. You got to get to that. Um, the the actual C native interop for Kotlin is is really a big deal. Um, you know, all my Swift side, Kotlin is a lot like Swift, right? They're very eerily, creepily similar, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, in terms of syntax and, like, general philosophy. And I, you know, I, I've done Father, may I confess? <laughs> yes. I may have written some Swift on my Galago Pro I knew for it. server endpoints, but I had to. I sponsor the damn vapor project. That's it. <laughs> I would say if Kotlin had this com- com- C compatibility and down to the metal function uh, ability that it does now, I might have never done that. 
Hmm. And that's, that's really a big because you're getting the high level advantages uh, of, you know, really Kotlin's like Java, but better, right? In a lot of ways. We can argue about like a judgmental term like better, but I'm a big Java fan and I think Kotlin actually cleans up a lot of like the getter setter or cruft of Java. And and I think that's valuable for the trade-offs you have to make. But having the ability to get native performance on top of that, on top of that syntactical sugar and convenience is super good. Yeah, uh, especially yeah. if you have like C++ libraries using on old Linux or Unix servers that are like doing data processing or what, I mean, I, there are a million use cases that I don't want to get specific, but I would much prefer to write like my front end cop or continue developing cop and then and just leave the C++ header it is. It's kind of the same promise of Go in a lot of ways. Although I think JetBrain is just nudging Kotlin this way where Go, it, it raise on, its reason to be is simply mm-hmm better C++, mm-hmm. right? Or easier C++. Mm-hmm. Huh. Both well, supported by Google now. Well said, and uh, I don't disagree with a word of it, so let's take a moment and thank our first sponsor this episode, and that is the folks over at DigitalOcean.com. And you can get started after you create an art. Go create an account and then use our promo code Coder Digital. One word. You put it together, you get a $10 credit. Oh! Now, DigitalOcean is a fantastic platform for spinning up really fast machines on their brilliant infrastructure. You get started in less than 55 seconds. They have SSDs for every type of machine. They have incredibly fast connections into the data center, tons of storage options. Object storage is also available. Their new spaces. Lightning fast networking. I mentioned that 40 gigabit connections into these hypervisors. Linux is the host operating system, KVM for the virtualizer, and then the distribution or free BSD of your choice. They also offer load balancing as a service. They can do all kinds of neat tricks at the networking level too, including a really advanced networking firewall. They have straightforward pricing. One of my favorite machines is three cents an hour. Three cents an hour, which is great when you get a $10 credit. They also have fantastic documentation. They just recently posted a really, really in-depth comparison of a bunch of different continuous integration tools. And I really appreciate these write-ups like this. And on the other end, which is also very useful, is they've just posted five common turkey setups for your turkey dinner. (laughs) Yeah, it's a list of commonly used turkey setups with short descriptions of each, and it's done in a way that only a DigitalOcean tutorial could be done. It's beautiful. DigitalOcean.com. Go over there and get started in less than 55 seconds. Check out their amazing dashboard, their straightforward, well-documented API, and their amazing pricing. With our $10 credit, you're going to be off to the races. DigitalOcean.com. Use our promo code CODERDIGITAL. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program with that dashboard for days. DigitalOcean.com, promo code CODERDIGITAL, and you can check out their community section for both those tutorials and other things. So there's a story that made our subreddit this week that is getting quite a bit of attention, and it's what is technical debt and why does almost every single startup have it? I guess even we here at JB have our technical debt. Technical debt is any code added now that will make more work to fix at a later time typically with the purpose of of achieving rapid gains. But what does it mean? Well, it's real. It's like any other kind of debt. Uh, uh, It allows companies to create software faster or build systems faster with the understanding that they'll slow down the software development in the future. They'll eventually be forced to spend more time fixing the debt than the amount of time it took for them to produce the best solution at the beginning. Technical debt can create a grueling experience for developers and inhibit long-term scalability. But nearly all startups incur technical debt. And they even have uh, graphed it. How about that? <laughs> they've, they've graphed technical debt in this article. It's, it's, it's uh, linked in the show notes if you want to see that, that graph. And um, I, I've definitely witnessed this myself. It, it starts really with you build solutions, and then you have, to keep, you have to keep solving problems and don't really have time to go back and fix it. And the core issue is, Maybe you'll disagree, Mike, but I think the core issue is that it doesn't matter how shitty the code is, as long as what the client or the customer sees, everything works. And so it could be a real shit show behind the scenes. It could be glued together with duct tape and, 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 and you know, all those different, uh, different things. It, it could just be just a total disaster. And it just 
it it really at the end of the day it only matters that it works and performs to the expectations of the end user or the client or the customer or whatever and so it becomes extremely hard for the staff the developers the IT people to properly see to, pro- to get management to properly see the value often in going back and cleaning things up because the only way you can avoid technical debt is by constantly refactoring and replacing the pieces that are just total shitholes. Do you agree? Um, I do agree, but I don't think that's super realistic. Yeah, it just doesn't happen, does it? Well, it's like saying you will run a mile every day and <laughs> eat, you know, three quarters of your meals will be vegetables and not, you know, ribs like I had for lunch today. Mm. And you won't have a bourbon sitting on your desk while you do code or radio, right? These are all things that we wish were true, mm-hmm. but they're not. So I actually would add to that technical that isn't just like the scenario that you laid out, I think is very true, but it's a little limited, right? But a lot of people don't know they're taking on technical debt. Right. Um, it's something you realize really, after the fact a lot of the times. You go back, oh, shit. Right. Oh. <laughs> it, it can be like ignorant of the technology, or it could simply be, you know, you don't understand the system you're supposed to be building, or your stakeholders don't really know what they want. You're building stuff based on assumptions that, you know, invariably you have to make, and at some point that's not going to be true anymore, right? You're going to need to change all that. I suppose technical debt could also be something that you have to do to support a legacy system somewhere else in the company. You know, like some old piece of code that you, like like this old, like in my case, it would have been old things that I inherited that have to keep running and have to work with the new stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just some what legacy other than like large masses of accrued technical debt, right? Yeah. I, it's, you know, for me, in most cases, it was, this is a thing that somebody else built that you never would have built it this way, but it's how we are able to do X. So it's like non-optional. You know, it's this non-optional piece of tech that's some, some homebrew thing that some previous guy did a series of incantations to put together. And it's like a process of reverse engineering it. And, and every time I have to troubleshoot it or fix it, or debug it, I had to essentially go on a research mission to like archaeology, like rediscover what were the motivations and the thought processes and the requirements and why was it done this way. And it would just be this huge amount of upfront time to get anything done versus something that had been built by myself more recently that was properly documented or whatever. So would you so this is a question I have toyed with for a while are dependencies another form of technical debt and let me maybe argue this out so like you know we talked a couple episodes ago about some of the pain from migrating folks off of the angular one but at the time angular the original version when it was more current allowed you to get jobs done at a price and at a time frame that frankly if you couldn't come in at that price or time frame you probably couldn't have closed the sale from a consulting perspective um, so, but that is a form of debt, right? And in a weird way, that's a form of debt of passing the liability actually onto your, your customer, mm. in this case, or your employer, because it would be good for like three years, right? It's been cool for three years and then it's not. Um, I would even argue that like cross-platform tools could be another form of more benign technical debt, like Xamarin and Ionic and things like that, because they let you get something done cheap. That's the debt part. So that's because debt is an upside up front, right? You borrow money, you use a credit card for the thing you want now without having to work for it right now or work as much for it right now. Right. I know it's kind of a, it's a leaky abstraction, right? It's a leaky analogy, but eventually there's interest on that. And the longer you go without maintaining it, worse it gets. Yes. Um, and actually, Ionic is another good point because Ionic One apps now have, you know, recently had the problem with uh, iOS requiring 64-bit mm. versions mm-hmm. and that you had to upgrade the underlying dependency of Cordova for most apps that was fine, for some apps that were heavily plugins. Well, if the plugin hadn't been updated by the maintainer, now you're looking at rolling your own plugin, which means you're going to be writing a bunch of native code on both platforms anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of ironic. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Well, I, you may have gotten away with it for two years. Though. Yeah, that's true. So, and so that's sort of that the, that's actually, the whole idea, right? Right. That might be like like taking on debt and going to medical school. That's a pretty good use of debt, right? Like, because you came out ahead. You're eventually yeah. going to come out ahead. Or shipping, right? Yeah. You actually managed to yeah. ship. Right. You don't get fired because you can't quarter rent or whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things we've done here at JB that are sort of budgetary reasons that are sort of now technical debt to an extent. And we've spent la- this last year of 2017 sort of replacing a lot of those things. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard process to start with because you're like, well, shit, it is working most of the time. Um, and you really have to like, go, well, no, we want it to be even better. And, it, and the thing is, is a lot of times for a lot of businesses, especially ones that um, you know, where, where there's more abstraction between the people doing the work and the people running the business, they're pretty okay with having to uh, essentially eat a little technical debt tax to, to just ship at the end of the day. And I, I mean, not to dwell on it too much, but I do think there's actually um, a, a, a practical, not necessarily a bad thing about that. Like that's, that's how it works. Those, we make compromises in life all the time. I don't yeah, think we I should think, be hard think, on ourselves, I guess is what I'm saying, which I have been in the past. Well, well, I, I try to avoid it, try to avoid it, but don't like, you know, kick your ass about it. So, so I think the, the bad case is not like if you know you're taking on technical debt, then that's a decision that I think is defensible, right? It's the people who don't know they're taking on the technical debt. That's a very different ball game. Right? Yes. They don't realize that they're charging it to a credit card, so to speak. They think, yeah, great, ship it. You know, we're good. I agree. Yeah. So, such as like pay developers. What's that? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Um, mm-hmm. Hey, you want to talk about DevFest now? I would love to talk about DevFest. So this looks pretty fancy. You can go to devfestflora.org to see the, uh, the, west, the rest of it, but it's Florida's biggest Google technology conference organized by three Google developer groups. Oh what the heck! In the middle of a it was that and that in, sounded that sounded like it was coming through some PC speakers too. Like there's a little handoff action happening there. Oh well, you know, you, <laughs> a little handoff action. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm twelve years old. Uh, <laughs> well, you made me switch to Mac. Yeah, I recognize my speakers. I know what speakers. I know what I know what it's yeah, here. No, you know what's up. <laughs> I, I am worried why why this dude. <laughs> we were supposed to be on the Linux box today. It was originally the plan. It was. I was going to make a big thing. I, Oh yeah, aren't, yeah. So let's talk about this. Then you had some gnome stuff you did want to talk about. I'm up for that. Oh, gnome is kicking my ass. You don't want to talk about the dev fest, or you just want to mention dev fest was badass. No, I'd rather talk about dev fest. Though, okay. We can talk about gnome really at any time. It's not getting better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> no, it's really just like audio issues, issues, multiple monitors, and like transitioning from that and out of that. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So I I actually really enjoyed dev fest. I think it brought together a lot of interesting people. Florida, I mean, it, it took place in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it actually took place at Disney World, believe it or not. That is really Which, great. Yeah, despite its reputation, Disney World has amazing bars. It's just a great place for a conference. <laughs> and you can obviously stay there. Um, a good mix of... You know, of course, like one of the main sponsors was like a digital agency, right? And they're like, yo, app store optimization, SEO. So a lot of that. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like taking up on agencies. I'm just, you know, sort of a consultant myself, right? Yeah. But you get a lot of like interesting people who are working in the enterprise who are trying to get a, get a handle around some stuff. Many of the topics were actually about Kotlin that we mentioned at the top of the show, which I, I really? on one or two of them. Oh, really? Well, I guess this is yeah. a Google event, right? And that's probably a hot topic. Right. A lot of RX Java, a lot of Kotlin. Um, I actually really good talk on uh, principles of machine learning that I sat in on, and it, it was fun to see, you know, how other people are using similar technologies in just radically different ways, right? Yes, I agree. That is a fun thing. And and just, like, oh, I never even thought of doing that. Like, one of the things was somebody was talking to me about how they're using Google for work. And they basically turned, like, Google Sheets into a freaking programming language. So oh, good. <laughs> like, I thought Excel nins were, were serious. Right, right. Like, just like, like, listen, let me tell you about my macros. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? She can do surveys. She does timesheet. Like, 
we make fun of the Excel macro people, but this city has effectively developed a scale right. HR right. application yeah. in Google. Sheets. Yeah, these are the these are the folks that get the office running. I mean, really, we can right. make this fun of where the rubber hits the road. This yeah. is how you get your paycheck, right? Like, <laughs> this lady's uh, a Google Sheet thing. Um, I learned a lot about TensorFlow, which I think we're going to talk about when we get back from New York, because I'm going to Dev New York, another Google, where they're having a hackathon for Google Life. So I may try to do a quick and dirty version of Alice, not running the Spot framework, running on uh, the Google platform. Oh, really? If I can actually get it. something okay. really small. Obviously, it's something like a two-hour hackathon. Or okay. Whatever, so. Yeah, I, I would look forward to hearing more about that if it pans out. But it was interesting because I've been so deep into the MSDN docs that seeing how, you know, on the one hand, it made me a little sad because there's a lot of wasted effort. Like the Google implementation of a lot of the stuff starting with uh, Microsoft's the Windows engine and the MS Bot framework is similar enough that it's almost an open source problem of radically duplicate effort. We all could have theoretically there should be one standard and people should be working together and it should be a lot better. But instead everybody's got their own thing. And that's not Google's fault, or Microsoft's fault. It's just the nature of business. But there are differences in how let's say Google is approaching some of these problems than the one I'm most familiar with is Microsoft. And it's really interesting. Like, like a lot of Python stuff, like Python machine learning platforms um, that I had never even considered mm. because I was coming at it from, from obviously the, uh, the Microsoft angle. And, you know, I'm heavily using JavaScript and I'm using a touch of TypeScript here and there, but most JavaScript um, with like a teensy wincy bit of F sharp where needed. Uh, so yeah, really cool. And I would actually encourage you because like these conferences, not like WWDC where they cost like sixteen hundred dollars in the hotel room, a thousand dollars a night. Um, I think this cost me a hundred bucks. Oh, okay. And if you're a student, I think you could go for free because there were plenty of students that told me they went for free. You got lots of swag. You got shirts. You got like you know the normal stuff like shirts, water bottles, stickers, the whole bit, and. You know, it's, particularly if you're a student, these sessions alone, you have experienced engineers up there basically telling you how they leverage, you know, Rx Java for Android apps. Or um, I didn't go to the session, but one guy was talking about, I think, Android Instant apps. And if you're interested in Android space more than I am, that's probably something you, you really would sit down and want to see. Yeah, I kind of want to know more about those. <laughs> I mean, I, I basically went to all the machine learning and TensorFlow sheds. Oh, yeah, good. And I, I, Board and I like peeked into half of the RX Java one. Then somebody, oh my god! Whoa, um, I can't even. I can't even right now. Yeah. So you want to do this? What? This is great. My father-in-law is apparently at Costco, and this guy's trying to sell him a TV, <laughs> and it's one of those made-up standards from Samsung. Uh, <laughs> so, and they want. Are, are you? Are you like the technical advice like helpline? Are you like the uh, call a friend? Uh, I need tech advice. Is this a good TV? I, I, yeah, and I gotta be nice because my father-in-law is a retired army sergeant, so I don't mess around. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, plus if you don't advise him on the right TV, then when it he'll comes, because like, the sales guys tell them, "Oh, well, this is better than HD." Mm, oh man, oh boy. So, so here's, the, here's the actual term: 4K plus. 4K plus, huh? Is that uh, like some sort of HDR? I don't even know what that means. Plus plus. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad it worked out pretty well, and it sounds like uh, you're looking forward to going to future events. Uh, so we have a link in the show notes. Obviously, it's going to probably be more applicable. You said there's one in New York, though? You know, I'm going to the one in New York. Uh, so it is December 1st and 2nd. I will be there. Oh, well, there you go. City. There you go. Go ahead. And, and actually, to talk about recording the show that Monday, because I will not be in my usual location. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we could chat it up on Slack and see whatever you want to do. Whatever you, I'm sure I can, you know, we can make it work. Live from the floor, it's Coda Radio. <laughs> All Actually, right, well, we, we've done that. We I, should talk about that. Okay. I, do have, a, I yeah. do have a very cool pick that personally for me is going to replace Google Docs potentially for show prep. Uh, and I'll tell you about it. It's pretty nice. Oh, yes, it's a good pick of the week. Uh, but first, let's mention Linux Academy. Linuxacademy.com slash coders is where you go to support the show and sign up for a free seven day trial linuxacademy.com slash coders learn more with that seven day free trial 
about their platform. It's a full-featured training library with everything you need to learn new skills, advance your career. They have public profiles, which is great for when you're job hunting. They have self-paced, in-depth video courses, hands-on, scenario-based labs that give you real experience. And I just love how this works. You choose your distribution for the courseware, and like, you know, Debian or Red Hat or whatever, or whatever, and it then automatically adjusts the OS, distro, whatever, that the virtual machine's running, and then you SSH into that, and you do actual work, and you walk away with real experience, which totally solves the test anxiety that I used to have. Speaking of going down for tests, they have courseware plans specifically for getting your certifications. If you want to move tracks, they have learning paths that are like content that's planned specifically for instructors to go into a new career task. And they have human beings that are available if you get stuck and you need help. And they have study tools you can download and listen to or read offline. iOS and Android apps. It's pretty good. It's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Go there, sign up for a free seven-day trial. And you're going to love it. LinuxAcademy.com slash Coder. Support the show and try it out. Thank you, Linux Academy, for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. So it's called Teletype for Adam, and it came out today. Um, well, yeah, mm. no, yesterday, as we record. Yesterday. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wednesday, yeah. Yeah, sure. And uh, it's, uh, it's sort of perfect for me because it's a plugin for Adam, essentially, that allows you to co code together. Once you install Teletype via the Atom settings or APM install Teletype on the command line, which, by the way, side note, love the name Teletype, totally nostalgic about that. You open a portal into, into a local workspace from a new collaboration menu. Boom, a portal. Then other people can join and you can give them a link or something like that, you know, or you give them like a hash. And then they put that hash into uh, their Atom editor. And then you, whoop, whoop, you join right. up. You, get, you, you both get a new tab in your Atom workspace, and you can just edit together in real frickin' time right there with syntax highlighting and all of that, which is, I, I just think this could be a big deal for uh, show production notes, because right now we do it all in Google Docs, and it's really clunky writing a lot of markdown in Google Docs. It butchers it constantly. This could be beautiful yeah. for collaborative editing. I know it's probably not up your alley, but man, am I excited about this. Well, actually, this reminds me... Um, you know, because I, I've been trying to, I have a 10 year old brother, as some people know. I've been trying to, I gave him a book on a certain programming language that I'm sad that I gave him, but he was interested in Swift. Um, this would be a great teaching tool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, very similar to like we talked about Cloud Nine a couple of years ago when they yep. first uh, were in alpha. Right. But instead of being on the web and doing like a browser, you actually have like a good editor living in. Yeah. I think that's a great use case, or in yeah. schools, because I, I would think in theory you could have as many people in there as you want too. So it could be a group, could be great for open source. Well, I've been hiring folks like coding boot camps, and why not have a virtual boot camp where you the instructor can be right there and the editor with you? It's a full featured editor. I mean, at, you know, I use VS Code, but Atom is like the same thing, huh. right? Yeah. I mean, there are reasons I prefer VS Code, but yeah. they're they're pure preference. And every once in a while, I switch between. So this this is, I mean, this is actually better than these browser solutions. I agree. Because the learning environment is the production environment, is right. the professional environment. You don't have to now switch and learn a new set of tooling. And uh, on the back end, kind of neat, uh, to connect the collaborators, they're using WebRTC data channels. They do an initial, wow. they do an initial handshake okay. that exchanges connection metadata via GitHub servers. All data flows over, they say, an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer connection. They, servers never see your files or your edits, which they say will maximize privacy and minimize latency between you and the collaborators, regardless of your proximity to their data centers. That's great. That's how you should build it. Juicy process. Yeah, yeah, but the fact that it's using WebRTC data channels does mean it's uh, WebRTC data channels uh, no, are very yeah. powerful. Yeah, that could be you know that that really could be a great way to go. I I'm I'm gonna try it out. I'm real. I'm really. I'm not a big Atom editor user, but I do have it installed on just about all my systems, so it's not gonna be a big jump. Yeah, to, I, I, Adam's I'd like. It took me and yeah, people who listen to the show for a long time will be bored. It took me a long time yeah. to. Like I was using Sublime, then I was using Jeff, then I was using a Macintosh app. Mac wow, Macintosh. Let me <laughs> let me get my ARP card right now. Um, I have a lowercase Mac OS app called Chocolate, um, 
what is written in the one true programming language objective C. Amazing. There we go. Uh, and then I tried, I kept jumping between sublime two, which I know is now old and, uh, you know, different editors. I ended up on VS code, but I, I honestly, yeah, apologies to JetBrains. I have no idea if you're like an independent developer or someone just learning and starting out, why you would not pick Adam or VS Code, why you would actually pay for an IDE, like a proprietary at this point. Yeah, the days of that are coming to an end, I think. It's like... In brief time, we've been doing the show. I remember when we started the show, the IDE of choice, actually it was TextMe, right? It was TextMe (laughs) on Mac. That's the one that like, I was like, gee, do I really want to spend $70? Yeah. Um, and then we both bought Sublime. We both bought that. We both bought Sublime, yeah, because, my God, this is so much better. (laughs) And now you don't have to pay anything. Yes, it's running an Electron. You're a zealot about that. Yeah, right? that is Sublime's advantage still. You know, I have not tried Sublime 3 for more than a few minutes, so I don't it, it, I don't know. Yeah. I have enough RAM that I don't. Yeah, and the thing is, is for me, is I open up that I open up the editor, and it's pretty much running all day long. So that initial load-up time is not a big deal. Yeah. And then I do spec the system... To run well, actually, I expect it to run VMs, but now I pretty much use that RAM to run Electron apps. <laughs> it's, it's bought it for VMs, and I use it for Slack and Skype and all the other crappy yeah. Electron apps. <laughs> oh, all right, Mr. Dominic. Why are they happy? Well, where do you what do you say? What do you know? Where should we send folks throughout the week to find more Mr. Dominic in their life? Uh, go to at Dumanuko on Twitter and go to dominicm.com. I'm going to have some, uh, some machine learning goodness on there for you. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, well, tune in uh, for uh, future revelations. I have new hardware to share with the audience. Mike has GNOME thoughts, but of course, we also have many development topics coming down the pipe. And you can supply some of those to the show. Go to coderadio.reddit.com and submit your stories. We try to check that before every show. It's a great place for your feedback. Speaking of feedback, you can also give it to us at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact i'm at chris les the network is at jupiter signal and our live calendar is jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the coda radio program and we'll see you right back here next week 